Welcome to the Red Wheels Panda Mixtapes and Mopeds Podcast. Three of us lifelong friends coming together to share stories, have fun with the world of sports, music, movies, sharing stories, have fun, and experience unforgettable experience of growing up in the Midwest during the 80s and the 90s. We're going to start talking today about sports and coming into um, the final four. We want to talk about things above music and the time of the 80s. We want to talk about things that are fun, entertaining, and make you laugh. Grab your Walkman, jump on your moped, get ready to get on a trip down memory lane with Mixtapes and Mopeds Mop Podcasts. All right, so let's jump in here. Um, the first thing, this week has been a fantastic week as of right now. We've got four final four week. Connecticut, the powerhouse. Purdue with the player of the year, Alabama with the run and gun offense, and the darlings of the tournament, NC State, with the man Big Burns coming in that everybody's watching. But let's go back to the 1980s. Andy, let's go back to 1983 with another NC State team. All right. I'm Andy. Some people call me Panda. That was Steve. We often call him Wheels. Uh Yes, and then the other guy, Tyler, red. You can kind of tell he has red hair still. I thought we were going to call him white. I mean, his hair is really on the white side. (laughs) I picked red, but man. (laughs) Uh, So as as Wheels said, NC State. So I watched that game um, over the week. I I caught the first part of it and the back half of it. and it was, I thought it was super interesting. The very first out of the gate, that big guy, Burns, from NC State. Now, um, that guy has been all over. The thing about that NC State team is I think every starter transferred from another school. And so I think that's kind of the, the new wave um, that we're seeing. But that big guy, man, he's like 6'9". I don't know how. Is he like 280 or something? Some, some of our fifty-five hundred, whatever. It came out today. It came out today that the pros from football are scouting him and are going to pay him to show up to the combine. Oh, my, Pitt, my Pittsburgh Steelers need an offensive tackle bad. <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm all over. I'm all over the Steelers page, and they're legit interested in him. How can you not be? I mean, those feet at that. But he has nice touch. He came out. And he was popping 14 footers and hitting nothing but nets. So that, I was like, okay, this could be interesting. And then, man, they just didn't go away. And, you know, the, the thing about that, they hadn't actually made a Final Four since 83. And I, I know that was kind of in our heyday and kind of in our sweet spot here for our podcast. And I remember watching that game as a youngster. And, you know, it was uh, – it was their Holy best- crap. I mean, don't you have goosebumps? I, I mean, I, I, I oh. we all watch. We watch those tournaments and oh. watching, watching that the end of that game, and watching the head coach Jimmy V run around the court going, yeah. "Somebody give me a hug! <laughs> somebody give me a hug! I want to hug somebody!" And there's nobody for him to go hug. He's in a suit. He's in a suit and tie, but his shirt's untucked and the tie's ripped off. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that was that. That was, and I and I was not a big. Uh, Jimmy V fan at the time, but that team thing kind of grabbed us because they were going up against the five slam and jam. But that was yeah. th- that team was loaded. They were blowing teams out. Hakeem, did you, did you, did you see that, that final score? Fifty-five to fifty-three. Yeah, it was like fifty-five a to fifty-three. Tyler, how many how many three points do you think were taken in that game? No, I mean, were they even shooting the three pointers? No, they, that's they didn't why I asked. That was the trick question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, you're trying to pull 1987. One on yeah, not 87 one was when they started the three pointer. Yeah, 87 was the first time they started the three pointer. Well, how about the women's game this weekend where the three pointer was different on one side of the floor <laughs> than the other? Did you see? Not to not the interlude here, but the, holy shit, are you kidding me? <laughs> hey, you're gonna see two three three pointers from. <laughs> Nine nine inches further back than we are. Whoops, we still won. How far were the NCAA say, hey, Portland? I don't think we'll be back for about 25 <laughs> years. God bless. How, can I, like, how could you not be sitting at half court going, 
I think that looks a little different over there. What? It made me think of the, it made me think of the old Snickers ad, the Chiefs and the, the chefs. Great googly moogly. You say the same thing. Oh, great googly moogly. Just take a bite of your Snickers. Maybe nobody will notice. Uh, <laughs> Uh, oh god! But that was uh, that that was kind of like the golden era of like uh, college basketball dynasties because that the five slam jam it came right on the heels of Jordan's teams, the UNC right. team. They went eighty one, eighty two. Yeah, yeah. They went back. Jordan made that shot when he was a freshman. Um, uh, was did they beat Georgetown? They beat what? Georgetown. Yeah. Yeah. And was then when uh, Patrick Ewing was there, yeah, yeah, because so, uh, Georgetown went to three title games in four years during that kind of scene. Eric, Eric Sleepy Floyd. Oh, wow, yeah. wow, yeah, that is a that is a yes. You know that's the beauty. Uh, this this time of year, March Madness. Uh, there is one team every year that America gravitates. To and it, you're right. I mean, this for the first time in what 40 years, uh, it's it's NC State this year, and it's because there aren't that. I mean, until just a couple days ago, you had all the ones and twos still in the game. The only big upsets early rounds were Oakland knocking off Kentucky and mm -hmm. uh, Auburn Auburn getting picked off. Other than that, Kansas, it was the... Kansas got picked off pretty early, too. Yeah, but they... I mean, this wasn't Kansas's year anyway. I, I, I didn't think so. But you had... You, you had the... I mean, even Purdue got through, and it's been three or four years of Purdue losing in the in the early rounds, and there here they are. Uh, but I don't feel like... Uh, you guys tell me. I, I don't feel like America is pulling for Purdue. I, I don't. I, America is pulling for NC State. America is not pulling. They're not pulling for UConn either because they're a back. They'd be a back-to-back -back champion. Nobody likes a back-to-back -back champion unless you live in in Connecticut, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I I'm curious how the the Burns kid, who's only six nine, is going to go up against that cheat code at Purdue. He's, what, is he like seven four? Whatever he is. He just, I mean, he doesn't even jump to dunk that guy. I just he doesn't have to. Yeah, it's it's just it's crazy. And I was looking, and this is like the most lopsided, at least from a betting standpoint, the final four um, matchups that I can remember. Because I think uh, UConn is over like eleven point favorite, and Purdue is like eight and a half. Those are not really competitive predicted games. That game uh, in eighty three. They, I, uh, Houston was favored by seven and a half. And yeah, give me. I was gonna say that. Give me NC. You know, I'm a. You know, I'm a. You both know I'm a gambler. Give me NC State and eight. My book right now is eight and a half. Give me NC State and eight and a half all day. I'm not saying Purdue's gonna lose the game. That they're probably gonna win. They're not gonna run NC State out of the out of the gym. They're just not. It all depends on if the big guy fouls out trying to guard Edie. You know, I mean that comes down to if Edie, yeah, he's not going to be able to shoot over him. He's going to try to block him out, and which you know that that might be the case too. He could really block him out pretty good if they have that as their that that'll be fun to watch. And kudos to Edie because I'm not a massive fan. And by the way, Purdue hadn't been to a Final Four since 1980, so it hadn't been longer for them than NC State, which shocked me that some of those good Purdue teams in the 80s and 90s didn't get to back to the Final Four, but um, Edie last year when they got knocked out first round, where well, they were a one, right? Got knocked out first um, round, yeah. sixteen. First round, same yeah, thing. Virginia, uh, you know, a couple years back, same deal they're yeah. going for right now. Yeah, and so last year Edie had a hard time staying on the floor, and this, you know, the, that last game he he never he was out thirty three seconds of that game. He played the whole game end to end, and he and I don't think he was even in foul trouble. So. Uh, I think kudos to that guy figuring out how to stay on the floor because when he's on the floor, it is literally a cheat code for that team, and they know how to take advantage of it. And you know, good for them. Take you know, you got one of those, you better take advantage of it. I wish. Right. Yeah. My team. We, ha one. we have to add one more basketball uh, 
note in here, and that's the year we saw the Fab Five oh. in North Carolina and Jimmy Jackson and the Buckeyes playing in uh, Rupp Arena. Rupp, in Rupp Arena, Lexington, 92, spring of, spring of 92. What's that uh, been? Uh, yep. 30, 32 years ago? Anybody that's not been to a basketball tournament game, this you know now it's you get priced out of it. But I think, I think our tickets back then were thirty two bucks each. Without <laughs> I know this. I teams. know this. When yeah. we drove up there, we didn't even we didn't even consider what the price of a ticket was going to be. Our biggest our biggest concern was uh, uh, gas money know. and beer yeah. and beer money and a hotel yeah. room. I mean, it, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we didn't we we didn't even think about buying a ticket to the game until we got up there, to, right? I hate to ask. Was that the was that the year we had a, a, a three gallons of beer in the car? <laughs> I don't remember that. Three yeah, gallons. We can spot this. <laughs> was, that, was that a Greg Bell? Was that a Greg Bell year where we had that three was gallons? Of, wasn't it the? It was the three of us and Greg Bell, wasn't it? It was. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. And we had we had three gallons of beer jugs in the car on the way going up there. And <laughs> Greg sense. Bell's going. I mean, it was a four-hour hour hour. drive. I mean, you need, <laughs> you, need, you need three gallons of beer for four hours, right? I mean, well, I remember one of, the, one of the most eventful things from that weekend is we didn't stay in Lexington. We went up to Cincinnati to spend what? the night after that. And we went and we down. saw Leitner's we saw Leitner's oh shot my God. in Cincinnati that, at the yeah at the bar right there on the river. We're on the one of those boats on the river. We were sitting there having dinner and drinks, and then that game uh, was the most yeah. iconic shot probably in college basketball wow. history. And yeah. we were all together watching that in a bar in, in let you're right in Newport. It was Newport. It was on the Newport Kentucky, Newport, Kentucky side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, That's crazy. Golly, that was a fun time. Jesus, Jesus, God Almighty. That was. And then Chris Gent for the Buckeyes missed a shot from the baseline to win it, and they win it overtime and end up losing Fab Four. Fab Fab Five. Fab Five. Fab five Michigan, on to yeah. You remember? Uh, do you remember the? Uh, did either one of you remember the regional final four? Can you name those four teams? Because I can. North Carolina. Even for that region. Yeah, for the region we saw, we saw it yeah, at Trump Arena. The, it was regional finals. It was, it was us. North it was Carolina. us. North Carolina. Um, was it UCLA? Were they the fourth? No, it was. It, 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 it was the Fab Five. Yeah, I know. Uh, it, it was it, it, North Carolina. Ohio Ohio State and the fourth team, nope. Eddie, Su Eddie Sutton's Oklahoma State Cowboys. No they, kidding. That's I who we got. I, I go back and look it up. I I just I I didn't I don't have that in front of me right here, but I that's who it was. Friday night, we watched we watched th those two games, and then Sunday, uh, we watched. We watched the uh, Ohio State, obviously Chris Gent and the and the and the Bucks and the Jimmy Jackson and and uh, go against the Fat Five. One of the best Buckeyes ever. That guy had more hustle. Oh, man, I love watching that guy. Fat Five. They, as much as I hate Michigan, Fat Five was pretty freaking good. Well, they were fun freshmen. to watch. They were fun. freshmen, right? Nobody does that. Like, look what happens to UK these days with all yeah. their freshmen that are all going to go pro and be. NBA All Stars, yet they go get knocked out by Oakland, right? You just and then they lose. They, they, they lost their coach halfway through the year, didn't they? Or was that the next year? That was a, the Fisher oh, coach. Did Steve, did Steve Fisher coach that team? Didn't they? Yeah. Didn't the, the Fab Five lose their coach the, like midway through the year? Maybe not their freshman year. It was a sophomore year. I, so Steve Steve Fisher, I thought. Because Bill, I thought it was Bill Frieder left, went to Arizona State, and Steve Fisher took over, and I thought he coached the Fab Five. Is that right? Hmm. Let's go look that one up. Yeah, it was that a big deal when Frieder edit. left. Edit. Yeah. Cut. And we don't have to be right. We don't have to be right all the time. <laughs> we don't have to be right. We just have to be entertaining. Exactly. Uh, so anyway, yeah, this weekend I think it's going to be – uh, a lot of fun with two kind of uh, big, overwhelming favorites, and I think the whole country will be pulling for the underdogs. And um, I and we haven't talked about Alabama, but they've never been to a Final Four. And you know, we I, I watched that team. That's hard. To, that's hard to believe. 
they they weren't they didn't play a lick of defense for the first three months of their season. Not a lick. They they could score with anybody. I saw the the high state play them and just run them off the court uh, back in uh, November. And I'm like, wow, that's a talented team. And it's not going to go anywhere. And I think somewhere they got religion on defense because they they're, they're still not a great defensive team, but they now will they're they're much tougher to score on, and their offense is still as good. So it'll be interesting to see that UConn team though is a you know borderline dime, shameful dime. plug on Alabama, shameful plug Mark Sears, Ohio University for two years. And ah. took, took took us to took us to the big game. I, he he wasn't around, but we we I don't we didn't make the tournament, but he was really good for high university. Oh, he he had the uh, the other good. kid that went to the the NBA. Those two were on the same team, I think. I did not know he was a <laughs> yeah. He's Bobcat right first two years. UConn. UConn's gonna UConn's gonna roll anybody. I I don't see how how can you how can you count them out of any game they haven't even been in a they haven't even been in a close game no nothing under 10 points yeah i picked them in my pool um, but um you know i i definitely want the underdogs to win i think most of us do so it should be an interesting weekend all right i think we've uh, kind of uh covered off our sports topic for the week so with that we're going to move on to I don't know if it's our second favorite topic, but uh, maybe even our most favorite topic, music. And the Red Rocker is going to uh, lead us into that. So Rock and roll. Rock and roll. No, we were talking, uh, me and the boys were talking about bands who we loved in the 80s and even 90s that are still relevant today. Not still together today, because for God's sakes, I mean... Kiss and Motley Crue are still trying to stumble through their third, fourth, and fifth uh, farewell tours. But as pathetic as those are, there are still there are still bands uh, today that were we were listening to in the eighties and nineties. The the one that comes screaming to to the forefront is U two, and we were talking about them playing that uh, they did that residency out at the New Sphere in vegas and what i wouldn't have given to uh to bet out there i just couldn't afford it uh i've got uh, a daughter in college and i <laughs> if she were not in college i could have taken that 30 grand a year so wait a minute, wait a minute. The, maybe... po- the, pot, the podcast is not paying off yeah. the cash isn't rolling in from the podcast <laughs> hello spotify <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, but no, I mean, a band like you too, that when I was, I mean, these boys are a, a, a couple years older than me, but when I was a sophomore at Ohio university in 87, 1987, that rattle and hum album came out of you too. It was a live album, but it had a lot of new music on it. I, that, that album's changed. It changed my life it changed my and i'm a music guy and it changed my listening habits it changed the bands that i was listening to i all of a sudden didn't care as much about um the 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 head banging uh stuff that i I had been listened i still love don't get me wrong uh weasel and the acdc and the Def Leppard and Poison and stuff but it it it, it single hand it, it it that was an album that was so impactful that uh, it, it turned me into a different mindset. I started listening to REM and and Billy Bragg and you know the stuff of the. the what did you study the, to? What did you? What was the music you studied to? And I, I hate to say that, but <laughs> I need it. I are you kidding me? I I got out. Of, I got out of you in four years. The skin of my teeth and my daddy's checkbook. I mean, I didn't. I didn't. Good lord, I study. Study, uh, man, I oh, was an wait, engineer at OU. <laughs> I had to study my behind off. Uh, Pink Floyd, wait. Pink Floyd, Pink Floyd got me through OU. That, <laughs> the wall, the wall is what I listened to to study. That was my comfortably numb. Pink Floyd. At, at, at I love three, that. Was how I, I love could study. Pink Floyd. You know that there's a band that uh, had they not, uh, you know, gotten into the fight that they're in. Uh, Roger and 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 David, they. Uh, would still probably be be making music t- 
today. But U2 is, and U2 is still impactful today. That The, the bands that are, they're, there's, they're few and far between. Think about that. I mean, it's been 40 years uh, from the 80s, 90s to, to, to now. You got U2, you got Def Leppard, just came out with a great album a year and a half ago that uh, Panda and I have been... Uh, you know, playing on jukeboxes and bars for the last couple of years on our touch tunes app, uh, kick. I mean that, that you talk about an album out of left field that they, it was so much better than it had to be at this point in their career. I mean, they're still on top of the world. They are, they, they are, are. going to have a mega tour this summer. Jeez. Did you I mean, ever see them? I saw, I saw them right in college. They, they were phenomenal. I saw them up at the Cleveland Coliseum. Yeah. Def Leppard before before the uh, car wreck with the uh, room. Well, yeah, I, I they were my first concert in, in uh, uh, eighty three when I was at Stanberry. Uh, Stanberry. Yeah, I was fifteen years old, so that was nineteen eighty three. They had just come over. Uh, it, Pyromania was not even out yet, and they played the Ohio Center. Crocus opened. This is when when uh, this is when Rick Allen still had his his right arm uh, from before the Corvette crash. Corvette and they, it into a telephone pole. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't <laughs> that doesn't fare too good. Um, I, that was forty years ago, and they're still they're still bringing it, and they're still relative, and they're still making new music. I I, uh, I got so much respect for bands like that that are still doing that after uh after 40 years i mean because we see so many of them pathetically and i used to love kiss don't get me wrong but they they are just embarrassing themselves at this point trying to tour and trying to do another farewell tour and trying to mop up what's left of their you know uh cash cow legacy uh, Come on, Tyler. Me, take me back to the '80s. You were a Violent Femmes fan, right? You love the Femmes. I, I, I did not like them in the '80s. I didn't. I didn't know them in the '80s. Although a gal, a gal that I did, I'm not going to name her here on the on the on the cast. But, but my first serious girlfriend as a sophomore at Lancaster High School uh, was a. She loved that first that first Violent Femmes album. Uh, she did. So I had to. Day I had to listen to it. But. After <laughs> Gone, Daddy. Gone. Follow. That was a but great album. Not, I mean, as good as they. Okay, they were great in the eighties, nineties. I even saw. I saw them at the Newport at uh, uh, Newport. Ohio State. Oh yeah. Uh, like in the ninety late late nineties, but they're not still relevant today. They're not even still together. No. Yeah, they I'm are. Gonna, I'm gonna. Hey, I'm gonna uh, jump in and say a controversial. Uh, make a controversial claim because uh, this is Tyler's favorite band, or at least one of his favorite bands, the Rolling Stones. So I I was a kind of Rolling Stones hits fan for my whole life until COVID hit, and then I got into vinyl, and I, did, I had no vinyl albums, and now I've got like 520. I did that all within about a span of a year. It's part of that process. And he's still into, married. Jill did and I'm still married. When when you get when you get like fifteen albums delivered on a daily basis, that that causes some problems. Yes. So so, but the Stones were. You know, I was getting into their catalog, and Tyler was helping me. You know, this album's better than that album, and all that. And so I got. I I. Be, it's almost like a new band for me because I was I was listening to you know some girls or Let It Bleed, you know, end to end, and hearing songs that I didn't know. I'm like, holy cow, these albums are way deeper than the two songs or three songs that I know. Um, and so I've really gotten it. In fact, Spotify tells you your you know top band that you play every year, gives you your list of top five. And the Stones have been number one for the last two years for me on my Spotify. So that I've really gotten into it. And so that, that's not controversial. What is about, I'm about to say is very controversial. They released an album in last October called Hackney Diamonds, they, they released a single in the summer last year called Is Angry, and I really liked that. And then the album came out, and, you know, Charlie's dead, and Bill's not around. 
So it's not the full like crew. Although there's a couple songs that they played uh, on that uh, album, but since that album has come out, and my wife is not a Rolling Stones fan at all prior to all this, CRC plays that album at least once a week, and probably more like a couple of times a week. We are so like engrossed in that album. The we album, walk- the whole the whole album. The al- there's not a bad song on that album, and here's. And here's here's what I'm about to say. For me, not for purists like you or anybody else, but for me, that is one of their top three albums they've ever put out. Wow. Yes. I, I, I have not I, heard I, one I, song on it. I, well, no, I've heard Angry, and I've heard a couple other uh, couple other tracks, and you, uh, Andy knows. I mean, he just said it. <laughs> I mean, the Stones are my... Probably my favorite, besides the Black Crows, maybe Foo Fighters. I mean, the Stones are my favorite band of all What's time. What's your song? What I mean, song? What's, give me, give me their favorite song, Tyler. Top three. Stones? Yeah. Oh, I can't. I mean, I, that, that's that's impossible. Uh, that's impossible. But it, it's easier to name albums. But what what he's what he what he's alluding to is that uh, it goes to the point of. Band still relevant today. How in the world are the Stones at eighty? Mick Jagger's eighty years old. How are they? Not only are they still making music, but they're obviously still making music that Andy and his wife and Jill listen to on a on a daily basis. It, it's it's mind boggling. The Beatles who many consider to be the greatest band ever made music for about eight years, 10 <laughs> years, maybe at the, at, at, at the most. Now I'm not discounting the Beatles at all. I love the freaking Beatles, but their span, their run was eight years, barely eight years. Stones have been doing it our entire lifetime. Yeah. Uh, it's it's it, it, it's incredible, and I obviously I need to, I'm embarrassed. I need to go listen to, I need to go listen to spin Hackney Hackney Diamonds tomorrow over over coffee. What? I, I will, they, they have one of my favorite stories. I'll tell it really quick. Uh, Andy heard this story before. I was out at the Biltmore Hotel in Arizona, and we were doing a conference out there. And the Biltmore, I mean, it is the primo, not five star, but four and a half, as high as you get. It's a luxurious resort out in Arizona. And at the time, 12 years ago, it was there. Uh, it was the Stones' stopping point. So they that was their central place. They were doing tour throughout North America, and so there, whenever they play a concert in Chicago, I fly over to Chicago, and fly back to the Biltmore. So uh, I, I didn't know that they were staying there, but I, I uh, was talking to the manager of the place, just sitting around having a cocktail, and said, uh, "Hey, dude, tell me your funniest story." He's like, "I'm not really allowed to tell you this, but I'm going to tell you anyway because it's pretty freaking funny." He said, "The Stones are staying here right now. It's on their North American tour." He said, "We have to post the person from the hotel staff outside of Keith Richards' room because every night he orders <laughs> he orders two bottles of." Uh, Jack Daniels. He drinks a bottle and a half. He comes out of the room butt naked and walks around the hotel. <laughs> and we got to chase him back into the room without him getting arrested or any of the other people getting pissed off. <laughs> that was 12 years ago. That's when he was 68. That, I was going to say that was only 12 years ago. <laughs> down I was going to say that was 1974. <laughs> oh, my God. That's down in a bottle and a half of vodka. Or, I mean, uh, Jack Daniels. Yeah. And I went, uh, he goes, oh, God, love him. I go, gonna, I don't want to know where they're Keith at. Will, Keith will outlive all of us. Uh, <laughs> he's petrified. So Keith gets one song, an album, typically. At least that's what it seems like. And his song on Hackney Diamonds is as good as... He's done in a long time. I really because do. most of them are dreadful. Yeah, this one it it really is really really good. I mean, he does obviously his voice is not like mix or whatever, but this particular song is he he nailed it. So I'm taking Jill to the Stones when they come through Atlanta in June. She's never seen them, and so we're we're hopeful that we'll get uh, quite a bit of that album. Although I'll be happy whatever with whatever they play, but. Uh, She's hoping that they'll at least play four or five. 
Uh, I'll throw hey, man, one more leave, out there. I'll leave, it, I'll leave it with this before I give it to you. We, we'll, hey, tomorrow morning or tonight when we when we hang up here, you ask me a, a song. I'm going to go deep for you. Go to uh, Goat Head, Goat's Head Soup and fire up Star Star. Wow. Okay. Goat's Head, Goat's Head, Goat's Head Soup, Star Star. And you text me later on the night and tell me if that's not if if that's not a game changer. That's one that you'll never even even Stones fans are gonna kind of uh, stare off into the distance. That that is a great song. It'll get you jumping around the living room a little bit, and your wife will wonder how many glasses of wine you've had. <laughs> <laughs> no, she won't. <laughs> There's no wonder, no wonder and amazement about it. Go ahead, brother. <laughs> All right, boys. We've talked about music. We're going to go into our next segment, and we're going to talk about movies of the 80s. And we're going to have the uh, – it's going to be the vote or what we consider. You know, I mean, they, there are so many good movies in the 80s. You know, interesting thing about it is what, what I saw is the budgets of those movies in the 80s and the box office. And, you know, and there happened to be a lot of the common directors, but I picked out three uh, that had a little commonality, a lot of common actors. San Elmo's Fire, 1985. Just a killer cast. The Breakfast Club, 1985. Another killer cast. And Ferris Bueller's Day Off are the three to talk about. I find, I mean, if you go look at them, I mean, we all, I mean, we all go back to Ferris Bueller's and go, you know, li living in Lancaster High School and thinking about, we got away with so much crap. And you're thinking about that day, I'm like, God bless. I remember how many times I used to talk to the girls at the admissions office and give me notes to leave the building and get out of school. I'm like, that guy led my life in, in high school. And then you go with the St. Elmo's Fire, man, that just that. What a great just movie of all the cast of characters and little different stories between Emilio Estevez and uh, the uh, Rob Lowe. And the, I mean, it's just a great freaking story. Allie yeah. Sheedy. Allie Sheedy. I loved her. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she was in both uh, Breakfast Club and there was actually yeah. a lot of overlap between those two movies. Right? Yeah. yeah. And then the Breakfast Hey, Tyler, did you ever serve detention ever in high school? <laughs> not Saturday school. I honestly don't. Did you guys ever do Saturday school? That, I mean, that's what that's what Breakfast Club is all about, right? Saturday school. Yeah. Saturday detention for a day. I never did. I mean, I did plenty of detention. Don't don't, don't get me wrong, but I I never did Saturday school. Did we do that at LHS? I no. I had I had I had one once that was assigned, and I had uh, Kel Kelly Hughes write me off that I was uh, I attended the uh, Saturday whatever it was it, I think it was Arden Reed that was oh, running boy. the detention oh. I was supposed <laughs> to be <Panda's> basketball coach <laughs> <laughs> and Kelly Hughes wrote out the yeah he was there <laughs> only time I, I ever showed up at LHS on a Saturday morning was for uh, the uh, ACT test and I got it I'm proud that I just told my Teenage daughters is proud to say I got an eighteen. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, Dad, I, I don't think I don't think you could do that. I said, Yeah, I got I got I got an eighteen. <laughs> they were bummed out when they got a twenty six. <laughs> I think you got a twelve for signing your name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I really can re I can relate to that, Tyler. I, I can relate. My, my English scores were uh, horrendous. Oh, just oh, you, you think I couldn't write a sentence? That's why we had oh you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we got to rank these bad boys. I I am not really sure how I would rank them. But I, I can tell you that I love all three. Um, to me, though, something about Ferris Bueller, it, was, it is just so different than any other movie from that time frame. It was just so just at a, running at a different beat. And we could all relate to it, even though I wasn't like a Ferris Bueller type. 
but we all knew those types, and you two were probably pretty kind of <laughs> blue. I'd say that um, was both Tyler and I, that's for darn sure. <laughs> yeah. And so that was just, uh, that to me is almost like the bar. And so to me, that has to be, at least for me, my number one. Breakfast Club was, you know, it was one of those that was this cast of these, all these actors that are at that time were like the up and comers. And the, the guy that really. Hey, by the way, Andy, Breakfast Club, $1 million budget for that. Oh, movie. yeah. When you, one, when you that was one of John Hughes's first films. $1 John million dollar budget. Yeah. All you need was a. Uh, but they were all like that. I, but I mean, they were in a school classroom. I mean, there was no nothing. They sat in a classroom for most of that whole movie. Right. One million dollar budget. That, yeah, that movie, and, and you know, it was just you know, and it was one as kids, y'all related to. Everybody had a different story of stuff going on, right? Well, those were all the same director. I mean, John Hughes directed two of the three. Club, he uh, direct, he directed uh, John Ferris, directed Ferris Bueller, Ferris Bueller. 16, sixteen Candles, which yep. was another great low budget eighties film that did so well. And then when you go to like a Saint Elmo's Fire, that was I believe uh, Joel Schumacher. Uh, Joel, Joel Schumacher, yeah, uh, that was more relationship movie. Whereas you know Ferris Bueller was corny humor, great. Don't get me wrong, Sixteen Candles, slapstick, stupid. Long Duck Dong, me, Long Duck Dong. Mankey, that totally different than, and, and what was uh, the, the the other Hughes film that did, you talk about low budget, R Risky Business, I mean that, the, so those were that was Hughes John Hughes, films. that was Risky I think, Business, I, I think so, I'll have to look it up, I'll have to look it up, that's off the top of the head, but I know, I know Hughes did uh, 16 Candles, Breakfast Club, did he do um, any John Candy movies? Was he in any of the Uncle Buck? Was that any of John? Let's talk movies? about Uncle Buck for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> We've got an Uncle Buck. <laughs> That's great. How's your How's your plumbing? I mean, I need a lot of cheese lately. I, 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 uh, God, I love that. That was 80, 89, because I was on spring break my senior year when I went, went and saw that movie. I, I, I love Uncle Buck. Where'd you go for spring break? Oh, God, senior year. We, <laughs> you talk about a story. We, this tells you where we came from. I mean, these day, this day and age, our, our kids would never do this. But the only way I could afford to go on spring break as a senior with no money in my pocket and no prospect of getting money at, at any point there was a there was a bulletin board at the student union that had like uh like like recipe card like index cards tacked up there with phone names and phone numbers and where they were going in other words it'd say it'd say like bo johnson uh, west palm beach florida bound and here's my phone number so to, <laughs> to share to share a ride right and so me and my but me i'm not kidding i mean so me and me and my best buddy we didn't have any money and so we went up there and we're like we want to go to fort lauderdale for spring break because we've got a friend that lives down there or his parents live down there but we got to get there right i don't have a car that can get to fort lauderdale from athens ohio and so we literally pulled a index card off the student union billboard <laughs> the bull, bulletin board and jumped in a car with a couple strangers that were just going the same way we split gas and we split arby's money and we just got down there and that that's that's how we did it i mean that i i my girls would never never believe that today because uh, if my girls did that today they they They'd be cut up and left in pieces in Tennessee. We did the same thing sophomore year. The, on the billboard, same thing. High University it was two hundred and eighty-seven dollars. Two hundred and eighty-seven dollars. That gave you a bus ride on a what essentially was a Greyhound, but there was a lot of students that were on it. We sat on a Greyhound for twenty-four hours, rode on that Greyhound to Daytona Beach, and these folks put us up into six guys into one hotel room. 
So there's the two double beds and there's the couch where two guys shared the couch. And that was everybody had that same sort of situation for $287. And the bonus kicker was on the bus, they supplied it with kegs, which was not yeah. good. <laughs> that was not a good idea. <laughs> So by halfway through the trip, everybody is absolutely stinking hammered going to, in the middle of the night, going down to Florida. <laughs> on, our next, on our next podcast, stay tuned because we'll talk, we'll talk about when, when uh, Randy Reese stowed, stowed away, robbed my dad's restaurant and stow, stowed away to Florida. Stay tuned for podcast two. <laughs> You definitely want to come back to teaser. You definitely want well, to guys, oh, Hey, uh, we want to thank everybody. I think uh, we all kind of voted Ferris Bueller's Day off as the best there, but uh, we want to say, uh, as we're uh, closing out our first podcast out here, we want to thank that uh, first listener for uh, tuning us in. Tune us in. Please go Thanks, tell Mom. your friends. <laughs> you go tell your friends. Uh, we promise we'll be uh, try to be uh, laughing the entire time, giving some st- stories like that coming along here. We'll be talking about sports, movies, music, and all kinds of other crazy stuff as we're going along. Don't forget, go listen to Red Wheels Panda, which is mixtapes and mopeds. Thank you, everybody. Woo-hoo! Pilot! <laughs>